Hey guys, so today is the last day of September and I finished the Tommy Knockers finally. And this is definitely a Stephen King book. This is I would give it three and a half, maybe four stars. Uh also you may notice back here I bought the, the Wheel of Time box set, the first five books. I guess if you count New Spring is the first book. Technically, it's the first four books, and then New Spring is like, well, yeah. Anyway, I don't want to talk about that. Um, the Tommy Knockers was one of those books that Stephen King wrote, I guess, when he was doing a lot of cocaine or he was drinking a lot. Um, it's weird. It's kind of, it's, hmm, how to explain it? It is about, I thought it was going to be about like an X-Files kind of story. Maybe a sci-fi book, kind of the way Fairy Tale is a fantasy Stephen King. This would be a sci-fi Stephen King, which it kind of is sci-fi, but it's also not. It's more of like a regular Stephen King having a crazy fever dream drug trip and explaining a bunch of crazy shit that's in his head, which is like a lot of, St a lot of Stephen King books are. There's more like flying Coca-Cola machines and X-ray guns and weird stuff like that than there is like, like that's one of the problems with the book is like, there's like inventions that these people start making and they use like D-cell batteries and stuff and then like some parts from stereos and they're like teleporting people across the universe, which doesn't make sense. That's like cartoonishly stupid and it's not possible. Um... So it kind of takes you out of it a little bit. It starts out with this woman, Bobby Anderson, who is a Western book writer. I guess he always writes about writers a lot and people living in Maine. So this takes place in the town of Haven, Maine, and it's about a writer. It starts out about a writer. So he always writes about writing and about Maine. Uh, she has like this property, and she has a little dog. She lives on a farm and has these woods. She was walking in her woods one day and she trips over this piece of metal and it's a UFO sticking out of the ground. What she later finds out. She starts digging it up and she digs a little more and she gets... Uh, her dog starts acting weird and you think her dog died from it so it's like making her sick. So this UFO, the more you dig it up the sicker you get and you start getting smarter. Kind of. So then she starts calling for help to this guy who's a, an old friend of hers James Eric Gardner and he is a drunk Stephen King writes about drunks a lot during the 80s and this chapter we're just explaining him he gets way into like alcohol and how being drunk is horrible and stuff but he also talks about like nuclear power and this guy's like really against the nuclear power plants and stuff and I was uh, listening to the uh, the podcast Hardcore History, the one about the nuclear, the Cold War and stuff at the same time. And I'm probably going to watch that new movie, Oppenheimer, when it comes out. We're, we're going to watch movies. Anyway, uh, so I've got this whole thing about nuclear stuff in my head. And uh, this second character comes along. Didn't really care much for him because I didn't really care about all the alcohol stuff that much. And I guess he turns into the main character later. Because Bobby Anderson, the woman, she kind of becomes an alien. Turns evil. So what happens is this UFO that's in the ground, there's dead aliens inside of it from long before humans even existed. Like before dinosaurs probably even. So it makes you think about It. The book It. Where the clown... Uh, was supposed to have been like from before dinosaurs. He was like a meteor that hit the earth or something. So then that makes you start thinking, okay, if this is like that, then this probably ties into the whole Stephen King multiverse. How does it fit in with the Dark Tower? Is it like the TV show Haven, which is about another bunch of... St he has a bunch of other books that take place in Haven. So in this book, the UFO will eventually... There's this whole middle part where the, the people that live in Haven, they all kind of become aliens because the ghost, somehow the, the energy in the ship is poisoning the air with radio waves or something, and the ship is supposed to be kind of like traveling along wavelengths 
of light or radio or something, and then sometimes they'll end up in the middle of rocks, which is maybe what happened here, but not really because it explains that the aliens crashed because they're stupid aliens. Like, they're smart, but they have no common sense. Like, they know how to build things and improve things, and they can make crazy, cartoonishly scientific creations out of, like, stereos and refrigerators and like toys plastic toys that can turn them into like guns that will vaporize you um but he says at one point he's talking to her they have this scene where him and her like at the table and he's got like a 45 like a pistol under the table and she's got this ray gun pointed at him and he's telling her like you aliens are like babies with guns you're stupid like you don't know what you're doing like you're not like they're using all these batteries to power all this stuff and amplifying the current or whatever in the batteries when they're not smart enough to know that you can just use direct current from the power lines and then convert it with an AC inverter or whatever like they didn't think of that or something so they're stupid but they're also smart so <clears throat> the third character he gets introduced is really good Hilly Brown is his kid he's learning how to do magic tricks he's kinda like a genius so he kind of gets affected by this thing coming out of the spaceship and it makes him smart where he invents this thing where he can make things actually disappear and reappear so he's putting on this magic show for his family and friends or whatever he does like a banana he does like something else and everybody's like yeah this is boring this is kind of stupid and then he puts his little brother in there and his brother don't want to go he's scared and he's like it's okay I'll bring you right back so he steps on the pedal of this machine he's made and his brother disappears. And then he steps on it again and his brother doesn't come back. And everybody's like, yeah, that's really good. I'm sure he's right under the box or something, right? And then they start looking for him and no, he's gone. And they can't find him. And then like a lot of the book is like them looking for this kid who's gone missing now. And like it doesn't make sense to anybody like how he just disappeared. And then uh, they explain like where he's at and they say he's on Altair 4. Which, if you've been playing Starfield like I have, you know, Altair 4 is the fourth planet around the sun, or the star Altair. Which is, like, so far away that even though this kid is on that planet, it's moving, it's so far away from us that, like, this whole book takes place in, like, five weeks, maybe? A little over a month? While he's on this other planet, the air is so thin, he would have died in that amount of time. But time passes so slowly where he's at that it's only like a few seconds or less than a minute or something like that. So by the end of the book, Gardner saves him somehow. And he has this computer program in this shed where all the, the, the smarter aliens go. And he brings him back to the hospital where his older brother has been staying this whole time. So it's like almost like he didn't even disappear to the kid because he's only been gone for less than a minute, so he doesn't know any of this has happened. This book's kind of nuts. But the whole middle of it, you got the first three characters introduced, then you get the whole middle of like this all just like weird stuff that the townspeople are going through, or they're inventing things, um, they're having nosebleeds a lot, they're becoming psychic, and they're forming this network of like telepathy and becoming a hive mind so it's kind of like children of the corn uh yeah so it's it pretty nutty and then the last part of the book i kept falling asleep a lot too but it gets better towards the end when know, this, this drunk gardener guy now he's supposed to be the hero but he's not really a likable character and none of them are really the heroes there's no really like not a big resolution to the plot either um he ends up shooting bobby killing her but she's still kind of around like these alien ghosts are still kind of because she helps him again at one point with her mind even though she's dead and like these police show up and there's like a big fire and the police see the ufo taking off but then it flashes you back to like how does the ufo take off gardner is like He's talking to these people that have been put in the shed and they're being used as batteries. One of them is the dog. The dog never died. He's such a battery. 
uh, Bobby Joe's sister that came and like disappeared. She said she went back home, but she was actually being put in the shed and used as a battery. And then Hilly Brown's grandpa, I think, was in the shed as a battery. And they had like cables stuck to their foreheads, and uh, they were still kind of able to talk, but they were being tortured kind of the whole time. Just the way, like on the ship, when they finally get into the alien ship, they see all these aliens, and what they're like is. Uh, they see the ladder has kind of got these like indentations in it, not for like feet, but like for claws. So they're kind of like, I would say they're like the bats, fruit bats or something, because they got really long legs and arms, I think, and they got these claw things at the bottom of their feet that fit into these grooves in the ladders, and they got snouts, kind of like a bat has a snout. And when, when they find them, they're all thrown against the side of the ship where it crashed because they were fighting each other with knives. Because, like I said, they're kind of like childish baby aliens. And they're having disputes and they argue and shit. And they're like, they're flying through space because they're so smart. But then they're also dumb enough that they kill themselves, which kind of goes back to the whole nuclear war thing. Um, humans are probably going to destroy themselves with nukes because we're smart, but we're not smart enough to like survive our own smartness. Um, so then, what was I saying? Okay, yeah, but, and then uh, he gets the battery people, he saves the kid, goes to the spaceship, he actually shot himself in the ankle at one point, and is, he's hurting in his leg, and he's like, she, him, she made him eat a bunch of pills, like Valium, then he vomited them back up, so he should be dead, but somehow he's struggling through. This ship, by the way, is as big as a football field, it's like a mother ship, and it's indestructible. Uh, so they've been like throwing dynamite into the hole and blowing chunks of rock off to kind of free it from this rock that it's been embedded in for like 230 million years or whatever it's been. So he gets in the ship and you also got to worry about the air inside of the ship is so old that it'll probably poison you and kill you because it's 230 million year old air. But somehow the first time they wore masks, but the second time, which is like the next day, the air has been blown out enough that he can survive it and he gets in and he flies the ship with his mind using these they stick headphones in their ears and they kind of control things with their mind using headphones but if something happens the it can cause like a feedback loop and it can just explode your head which happens to some of the aliens and I mean, it sounds like I'm talking gibberish right now because it's so weird uh yeah, there's like a guy telling, selling t-shirts that had, because everybody kept getting bloody noses. So then, like, this is what I don't like. Stephen King has it. First character, second character, third character, fine. Middle is like everybody in the town, doing their town stuff. And then you start this whole process towards the end. You're wrapping things up. So you're about 100 pages, 150 pages left. He introduces a new character. Why? We're almost done. Are you bringing in a new character now? So now all of a sudden there's this news reporter who's gotten a whiff that something strange is going on in Haven. And he's going to try to go figure out what it is. He knows probably something's wrong with the air. So he's renting this air backpack thing because usually we get a scuba tank to go underwater. He's getting like a mobile over the ground air pack. And the guy's like, that seems weird. Why would you want that? So then... He's telling this guy at his office, like, if I don't come back, call the, the army or something because something bad's going on, I'm probably dead. So he doesn't come back. The guy's like, oh, shit, you got to call the police. He explains it to the police. The police go out there. They're dead and they die. And then the fire happens and then, like, the army kind of gets involved. And the president is, like, watching shit. Like, the whole world is watching this small town at this point. Uh, so why did you introduce some new characters to kill him off that quick? But then you got like maybe 50 pages left and he introduces another new character I think was it that guy's boss there was a couple other new characters I think maybe like from other towns with the fire department or something it was kind of weird just introducing characters late in the game like that I could see somehow like in horror movies maybe it would be a good idea because you're like bringing in a character to save the characters that are like being chased by a monster or a ghost or some shit, but it's just weird. Um, so yeah, now I'm thinking about and it, there's a TV series called The Tommy Knockers based on this. I might check it out. 
I kind of want to get back into that Haven TV show and watch it because I don't understand. Like, if this is part of Haven and the spaceship took off and everybody in Haven died, is this like on a different multiverse where the regular Haven TV show stuff is like a different version? And like, everything that happens in Haven and that multiverse, nobody ever found the spaceship, so there's still a spaceship buried in that town, but nobody's found it. That'd be kind of interesting. Or, vis-a-vis, also The Revival. This book kind of reminded me of The Revival, because at the end of it, they had like these ants that were like aliens, sort of, and they like, when you, this guy's a preacher and he dies and he finds out when you go to hell, you actually just become slave for this alien race of ants. But it also reminded me of Under the Dome because there's aliens in that book. And this book talks about like force fields they could create to keep people out of the town and like these perimeter guardians they would make. So in uh, Under the Dome, there's like a force field around this town and it was made by this child alien. It had like He had like a toy and he was playing with his town like you would. But kind of like the Lisa Simpson episode where she's got her little tooth and it makes a whole civilization. Uh, there wasn't anything about pink stars falling in this book though so it can't really relate it what was the other one was there another one with aliens oh yeah Dreamcatcher had aliens so it makes you wonder are these the same aliens different aliens as like the other aliens in the Stephen King books different versions of Haven uh, like is this universe on a different axis of the uh, the dark tower you know with the the turtles on one end and the bears on the other end and you got the other two axes with the other four animal guardians maybe this universe takes place on one of those other like multiverse I don't know it makes you think though it's pretty cool but I don't know I think this book is just like too long too wordy I kept falling asleep it's only like 550 pages but it took me like two weeks to read this thing I don't know I think that's all I gotta say about it